I was out of town last month, so it's great to get back and finally get back to the first meeting. When Kelly actually first asked me to come here and talk about wildland fire, fire mitigation, and what we're doing with it and what it looks like for our, our community here, probably one of the largest threats we face up here is wildland fire. Wildland fire has changed significantly. I started wildland fire in 2003, and since then, over the last 10 years, the face of wildland fire has changed. They're more catastrophic. They're larger. Every year we're setting more records, which is very dubious honor. Those are not the records we want to be setting. Last year, three of the top five largest wildfires in Colorado in history happened this year. That's not normal. So the, the landscape is changing and fire is changing. And the fire protection is what we're trying to change with. So, first off, a little history on fire department, in case anybody didn't know. Founded in 1948 uh, by some residents up here, they had. It's kind of ironic to go back and read some notes because they felt so many people were moving to the mountains they needed a fire department, which is funny looking at what it is today. Then in the late 70s and early 80s, we ended up getting a surplus ambulance and started an ambulance service. Then in the late 90s, late 60s, we first started hiring people. Hired one person during the day to help the ambulance calls, and then I expanded to where we are today. Today we have four career professional firefighters on. Per shift, 24 7, total of 12 line staff, so structural firefighter, EMT, paramedics, 27 volunteers, and a 10 person wildland fire suppression module, as well as a 4 person fuel crew. And that's where we're at. All of our expansion has been born out of need. Um, over the last probably five years, our big expansion has been towards wildland fire. Like I said, wildland fire has been the biggest threat to me. It, it, it affects all of us. It can affect us. Not only on the front end, you know, wildland fire that obviously, you know, burns up trees, but on the long end, the long term effects of wildland fire can last years. Uh, Grizzly Peak Fire last year, everybody saw I suddenly closed on 4th of July weekend as a result of the Grizzly Peak Fire. That, I don't think that's ever happened before. I was talking to the president of CDOT, they, they have analytics to talk about financially the impact of shutting down I 70 on 4th of July weekend. So a lot of that fire up here, what our district is is 98 square miles, which is right around 62,000 acres. Um, we have right around in our district 6,500 homes. And with that, these, these numbers aren't exact, about 19,000 people. So every wildland fire in our district could affect that significantly. Last year, the East Troublesome Fire, you know, I can see from my dad, you guys on Shadow Mountain, when they made that big run. I, you know, I can see the glow from my dad. If anybody here on the pipeline, you can see it, it ran 100,000 acres in October. Unheard of. Never happened. Then it jumped to the divide. Yet again, it never happened. You know, I've been on fires in that area and the divide is always, you know, fires never going to jump to the divide until they do. So fires are changing. The numbers are getting bigger. And it used to be one of the cool party charts, one of the charts of county FMLs, it used to do an overlay of the high metal fire, um, high metal drive over on Road 26. If that fire would have been oriented, in the 285 corridor, the wind of it, it would have slipped off a good portion of our district. It would have had a significant effect. You know, depending on where it would have lined up, it would have landed right around the first 70 years. What are our fires here? Most of the time are wind events. A lot of times, the three drivers of wildland fire are fuels, weather, and topography. Fuels, obviously, all vegetation, all combustible stuff. They can dry it out, then they're receptive to fire. Topography, steep slopes, canyons. Fire likes to burn up hill and then wind. Wind is one of the huge components. We have all three of those things up here in excess. So yeah, yeah, wildland fire is a big, big risk. So what we've really tried to do, my friend says Chief of Laughlin, he was here, he, he's the one who first brought us into the chamber, which was great. He really saw that need and started laying the foundation for where we are today. He started building up these programs and then when we went for our last levy increase, one of the things we did, we really wanted to our wildland fire capacity. Suppression, I feel we're very good at it, and they're very good at it, like all the departments up here, but we really weren't good on the other end of it. The mitigation and the prevention. So that's what we've been trying to expand. So, we can. 
So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go through a website. What this is is something that everybody, if you try to build this website out, it's going to be a resource for everybody. It has a ton of information on it. What the information is there for is to get, provide actionable data for the residents up here. You know, it's not just pictures and stats. We really want to provide something that's useful for people. So I'm going to kind of go through this and talk about a lot of the programs that we have. So the first program that we're going to, well actually, So the Wildfire Morning Briefing is something we put together. What this is, it's, it's a little excessive when you get into it. It's, it's pretty nerdy and fire fire from but it's a basic overall picture of what's going on in the country from wildland fire standpoint. We look at it almost every morning. This is a briefing for all our firefighters. It talks about the weather. So the fire weather, the plenty of drivers and fires. We look at it every morning to see what the weather is. Temperature, RH, lightning, etc. We've got this on our website. You can kind of scroll through. So it's got weather, it's got big incidents, it's got national situation reports, all the data of wildlife fire in the country. Um, so see if you can go back to that Go back to that window there. <laughs> and that's there. Um, so. And that, that's just there as more, if, if, there's, if you see a big fire on the news, you can actually log on there, it's all public. It's all public data. It's all just gathered in one place and we can read about these fires. And it is relatively interesting to see what's going on. All the way down to one of, one of the big metrics that I always look at, especially now in the world that I'm in, is how much it costs to suppress these fires. The cost of wildland fire is staggering. Uh, it's, it's really interesting to watch how much it costs to suppress a small fire. So the next program that we started, and this started in July, She'll come out to your residence and do a very detailed assessment of your home starting the building on the low out into your property. A lot of the science has changed in why the fires, why houses burn. You know, our focus here is wildlife urban interface. Has everybody heard that term? Which is ironic. Probably 12 years ago, that was this kitschy term. When I started in wildland fire, nobody ever heard it, but it took this crazy class called the wildland urban interface. And Structural firefighters have never heard that I heard it coming back as a volunteer at Creek talking about it. What is that? Everybody knows that. I was just listening to a story on the radio about the WUI. It's, it's become something that's even part of our regular vernacular. The WUI is where the built environment meets the forest, which describes everywhere where we live. We live essentially from 470, all the stuff we mentioned. <clears throat> and so the science in the last five, six years so 10 years ago, there were, uh, during several fires in Colorado, there was a miracle house. And I'm sure everybody might see in California, the miracle house. It was amazing. This house survived. You know. Then you hear people talking about the river fire coming through. And then you start looking at the area of use of those neighborhoods. And you see the foundations. And then looking at it from a scientific standpoint, yes, they have the foundations. But then looking at the big picture, there's still vegetation untouched by fire around those foundations. So people started looking, well, why were those houses burning if vegetation wasn't burning? And what was being found? It was actually the house itself. It was the construction. It was a lot of the small things with the dwelling. That's what's leading to these houses burning. It's not the big river of fire. You know, there, there is that component. There, that happens a lot. But the ember cast, the embers land on houses 
And if they're not hard, there are a lot of small things we can do all the way down to changing vent screens that will limit the amount of intrusion into your house, which will limit houses from burning. There's new science coming out constantly. Uh, last year in Washington and Oregon and California, I'm sure if you saw those fires, it's catastrophic. Your towns are no longer in this anymore. So there's going to be a lot more science coming out of this, and that's what this program is based off of. Looking at the hardening of the house and lessening the home emission zone, and then working out. It's a lot more than just cutting out a few trees. It's working at your house, hardening your house, then working out, then doing the fire mitigation. If fire mitigation has changed quite a bit, and Danny can attest to this, it's no longer what, what people think it used to be. You know, cut down all the trees. I got an email from somebody yesterday. I, I want you to come out and tell me to cut down all the trees. That's not what fire mitigation is. What we're trying to get back to is appropriate forest and restoration program. And that's the new science with fire mitigation is this forest restoration. Bring the forest back to what it was, you know, a hundred years ago, back when Mother Nature brought fire through on a normal plane, you know, without houses, without unmanaged forests, to clean up the forest. So fire mitigation is not just laying down the trees. So this program, if you sign up for it, there's an associated cost, it's a hundred bucks. Uh, our mitigation specialists come out, Look at your home, they give you a very detailed report. Uh, a lot of them, it takes about two hours on site, and then they'll come back, process report, and get you a support. And the, the whole idea is to provide actionable data about how you can increase your probability of success if there is a lot of that fire. On the two side of the fire, yes, there is going to be a catastrophic fire in the CFT, the large 200 foot play lengths. That's a problem. There's not a lot that can be done about that, unfortunately. There's not aircraft that's going to stop it. There's not firefighters that are going to stop it. Firefighters and aircraft are going to come in when that gets lower. That's when they're going to come in. Where the home hardening really makes a difference is when that fire is doing that one ridge over and all the embers are landing onto your house and onto your property. That's where home hardening and fire mitigation makes a difference. It's been proven over and over again every year that that actually makes a difference. So we really encourage people to do it. It's been a good program. We did a lot of feedback. We started last year in July. It's been going on for a year. I think we've done 162 assessments right now. Uh, we, I mean, we have 62 on the books. Uh, we're doing this program jointly with Air Canyon. And it's, it's a tremendous success. Uh, Evergreen has also adopted it, as well as Gen C. Uh, there are a couple places down the hill that are much larger. They're looking at adopting it. So it is a pretty successful program, and I encourage everybody to take a look at it. Further down on this website, there's a lot more talking about fire mitigation, home hardening, a lot of resources. Uh, you know, it talks about home addition zones, a lot of stuff to read on that. Next program I want to talk about is our chipping program. Our chipping program started in 2017. Our chipping program started, my friend says the chief of Waffle started, he gave me a budget of $75,000 and said, you know, can we make this happen? It's here since the Southern County has a great program, they're doing it really well, it's really better than our district, how is it going to work? So we started the program with a substandard chipper, a 2003 surplus cop car, literally it was a police surplus truck from Waffle Junction County. And two guys, one of them I had met on fire as part of my career, and he was in the middle of trying to find, he wanted to work for a different agency that he was working, so he called me literally within that week, the chief of law, and asked me to start doing that. I said, great, amazingly enough, I might have something for you. That's Jason Packenfuss. He's been our module leader in part of the program since the beginning, and he's still here, he's still with us. Program started, we just started doing HOA shipping days. Um, we would go out and work with HOAs and they wanted to do a community wildfire reduction on fire rights communities, and it was a tremendous success. It was really kind of grassroots trying to inspire homeowners to actually you know, work on their property, and we would help them do that. It's now expanded into, uh, we have signups online. We, last year, I think we did 450 properties. This year, we opened up our signup. We also brought on a full-time, or a seasonal, uh, fuel hazard fuel reduction crew. That crew is hired in conjunction with entertaining fire. Their whole job is wildland fire hazard fuel reduction. They do a community chipping program. They also
also uh, go out and I'll talk on fire mitigation projects and U.S. mitigation projects that we're working on as well as response. That program we open it up and we're hoping to open it up here in the fall again. There's all the specs on our website. We even have very specific things. The piles have to be five by five by five. We have 15 piles, but it is free of charge. Hopefully, we're going to have that open up in the fall for another 100 addresses or so. We, we've kind of edited the load to get the current success. I'm sure some people heard how uh, it, it, it was kind of problematic. We, two years ago, it was a we had a number of wildland fires. We had, I think it was nine wildland fires within our district. Several of them got to be four or five acres. Not a big deal, but that does take a lot of time. So then our Tuning crew was actually out of these wildland fires for a week here, a week there, a week here, a week there, and then winter came early. Hauling on an 8,500 pound chipper on Conifer Mountain in the snow is not the best idea. So that kind of set us off as well. This year, I think we've learned from all of our growing change, and I think it's a much more efficient program. We're giving you a lot of good feedback from the residents. And then the next page. This is another program that we launched, the Community Ambassador Program. This, this program came out of our Wildfire Preparedness Program. What this is, with all the interest in fire mitigation and what people can do to help themselves with wildland and fire, communication can be tough. I, I've seen emails and phone calls all day, which is fine, but it got to the point I wasn't able to return in a timely manner. And with this program, a lot of other places have started a Community Ambassador Program. What this is, is with HOA <coughs> person has reached out and said, I, I'd love to help with this. And what that does is it points one person in the neighborhood to kind of get a conduit from information between the neighborhood and the fire department. We have, I can't remember how many we're at right now, I want to say 18 to 20, this website's not updated. But, scroll down, this is the map of our ambassador. So what this is, is if you live in this area and you're curious about fire mitigation, real fire home assessment program, maybe the fire rights community, Anything to do with wildlife fires, mitigation, and protecting your house, click on one of these. It's got the contact info for that community ambassador. They're into the program. They have a direct icon to the fire department, and they, they can help with a lot of that. It was really a way to increase our outreach and increase our communication with the community. It's been going really well. We've been having face-to-face -face events finally. It was pretty tough to launch this program during COVID. It was tough to launch. <laughs> Community based face to face meeting program during the pandemic. It wasn't <laughs> ideal, but it did work out. We, we were able to like, really start to have community meetings, and it, it, it's working out a lot better. Yeah, and then the last one is projects. This other page right here, we're, this, we haven't updated this. We, we keep this up with what we're working on. So you can see where our tools are. Are working. This includes our cloud burning projects. We do a lot of cloud burning, uh, as well as our cutting projects. Uh, we do large scale cutting projects in conjunction with Colorado State Forest Service. Most of the time, when we end up on cutting projects, our projects that are either too steep, inaccessible, they're not terribly, they're not great jobs for a lot of private contractors. We look at what happens is Colorado State Forest Service puts it out to bid. Most of the contractors look at it, they'll take all the flat stuff, machine work, anything over 30% slope is what it machines. It ends up being something that either can't get done or we'll be able to come in and do it. And so that's where most of our projects we work with. Right now, we've got a large scale project with Glen Elk down uh, Elk Creek Road, in the Hope Box Town. We're doing a few, uh, large fuel break there that eventually we're going to tie into Douglas Branch. What we're trying to build eventually is large scale preventable features in our district. You know, that's, that's a long-term goal where we're going to have these actionable items that on the off chance a wildland fire does come, we're going to have some things built out that we can actually do to defend large areas in our district. In this map, as we build it out, it will have more cutting projects. So okay, what this is, is if you're curious, if you drive by and see the trucks, if you're team size, you can get out here and see what the project is, we'll talk about the size. We're trying to expand this map with Colorado State Forest Service and some of the larger scale projects that are going on. If anybody's driven down Pleasant Park in the last year or so, there's a, there's a lot of fire mitigation going on. The last one I want to talk about is 
everything that we're working on. So as you saw, this is a joint program between us and your gang and fire. We work together constantly on calls, we work together all the time, and it just it made sense to do kind of a cost share because it's a benefit to the residents to see those districts, as well as a cost share and a savings for us. So we started doing a lot of these projects together. One of the projects we're doing is going a little bit more is we are reviewing our community community, our community welfare protection plan. The last time we did that plan was 2005. Uh, it was good at that point in time, but it's extremely dated. Science is changing, fire is changing, mitigation is changing, so we're, we're updating that. We're currently working on that now. We do have a uh, group of community members that are giving community input on that. And what we're going to do with that, once we have that, these are all the five components. Uh, so analysis of risk, local input with a strategic plan that's the community member, mitigation prioritization, evacuation assessment, and recommendations for homeowners. Yet again, the saying is the idea is to get actionable data for people. If, if we do all this and we don't actually get it out for people, it doesn't matter. So that was kind of the, the, the driver behind this website is to have a platform to get everything to the community. Once this is out, it's going to help hopefully be a roadmap for all the work we're going to be moving forward. The other component we're going to get a significant need is a lot of tactical maps. So if we do have a lot of land fire, we're going to have maps as firefighters that will help us during the suppression efforts. In the last bit, if we started getting, let's scroll down a little bit lower, we started getting maps for the CWPP. They're using a lot of analytics and uh, computer modeling to start coming up with what our, what our district looks like. And this is really small, and you probably can't read it at all. So, <laughs> it's, it's tough. Uh, I, I, you know, if you can get a chance to look at our website and you can see these, either draft maps are not final, that's why we don't have them downloaded, that's why we're not doing anything with them right now. What this is, it shows our, basically our fuel modeling of the district, what we have here. It runs down through all of the fuel models and essentially what we have is we comprise a large timber component with the grass understory and when we start getting lower elevations it's mostly brush in our canyon. Scroll down a little bit more. So once you have this, you can start running a bunch of other modeling out of it. And a lot of these, yeah, a lot of ground fire activity, a lot of them are, you know, not great. I mean they show pretty much what we all know. We live in a very high risk area. Scroll down to the last one. This map is the rates of spread. And what this does, this is going to help with work, working with the county right now on evacuation planning and processes. What you can see is rates of spread. So rates of spread of wildland fire based on a very antiquated measurement called the chain. It comes from surveyors' chain from I don't even way back to the like early 1900s. Um, it went 66 feet. So when you see this, what we're looking at is rates of spread, sometimes they're greater than 64 chains per hour. You, you can do the math on that. So that is your, your orange color here, the, the red orange color. Creates a rear of the map. We live in a place with extremely high risk of wildfire. And the reality is the fire department is not going to be able to do everything with it. We're going to do everything we can, but we're really trying to empower people and work with people. We're partnering with HOA is really trying to get out there in the community, and that's, that's really what we're doing. That's the expansion of the wildland fire program. We're going to continue to expand um, and adapt to whatever the future brings. We're going to have flyers, and there were a few hiccups with some of this. Uh, we have our, our we have pre-planned software. So all the business owners here, I know everybody probably knows Roger Parker. He's, he's diligent. Um, <laughs> Part of our pre-planning software is, so he goes into your businesses, he takes the pictures, but we have on our computers, when we get a call to your business, we have all of his information. What that's done is that's changed our, our response dramatically. When we go to your business, there's no longer looking for the fire control panel. We're not looking for the knock box. We're not looking for the sprinkler control panel. We have everything in our software, which has been tremendous. One of the things that our software started doing is, the Community Connect program. What Community Connect is, you can get on our website and you create a profile. We encourage everybody to do it. We're gonna start another uh, social media blast about this. And what you can do with this is you get in and you put in information about 
your house, your business, if you have pets, if you have, we're really, we have, we have a number of people with non ambulatory or developmentally disabled family members living with them. In Community Connect, what you can do is you put that information in there. If we have a response to that address, that information will come up on our mobile data terminals in our computer. So we see that. So if we go to, heaven forbid, a structure fire at that address, that will see that, you know, there is a non ambulatory person in this house. So that's a big heads up for us that we need to do something with that. The other thing is pets. Yet again, if we go to the house and for some reason there's a fire, some sort of accident, you know, or a wildlife fire, we have all the information about pets, um, gate codes, anything about the property you can put in Community Connect. When we first launched it, was it eight months ago? A lot of people talked about security. It's the same encrypted security that everybody uses on PayPal and everything else. Security is not an issue. Uh, firefighters only have access to it as part of our free planning software. Uh, we've got some flyers. Um, I discovered last night that this link is dead on our website, which I'm going to see when they get back to the firehouse. But I encourage everybody to look at us, and we will have a bunch of social media blasts coming out about Community Connect. But it's great. I really encourage businesses, private residences, get on there, put any, any sort of information on this because it what it does in the long run is it helps you and it helps us. Questions? I, I think I ran over time. Sorry. Yeah? So the question is, is the comment in the sense that my wife and I live in the King's Valley and about three weeks ago, John and Sebastian came over to our property. And then on um, Wednesday, Julie came over. Ah. She actually spent about three hours yeah. uh, walking on the property and she created a problem with <laughs> She's very good with the hand spray paints. Um, <laughs> I haven't gotten the report yet, but uh, she was exceptional. Both of them were, but uh, the time that she was willing to spend with me and explain various things uh, was uh, really appreciated. Kudos to you guys for the program. Awesome. Wonderful. That's great to hear. Julia is a true asset, and John Sebastian is one of our community ambassadors. Uh, he's on the map. Um, very helpful guy. He's, he's really into working with the community. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. 